G'day guys, welcome back to the football come down. It is finally the end of the buy rounds, which is a relief in itself. And uh, you guys have come really come through the comments this weekend discussing this weekend of footy. Just the six games, but heaps of comments. So we're going to get straight into them. We've got a few general comments to start off with. Frio Fidget Man, Fidget Frio Man says 1980s footy might be seeing a return. And then Joshua James Taylor says super high scoring year I feel. Lions and Blues this round and the Suns with 160 something a while back. Yeah, across the board, scores have really elevated in the last few weeks. A lot of them seem to be against Geelong as well, if you look at that. Conceding scores are over 100 a lot, but it is across the board. Like St Kilda, what do they score? 106 against the Lions. Um, you know, that in itself is interesting. You know, I just finished watching Essendon and West Coast. That game is relatively high scoring and West Coast scored... 92. That must be their highest losing score in a game for some time. And I think possibly what's happening is over the course of a season, I've heard one of the Scott brothers um, describe that, you know, early on in a season, teams play a little bit more conservatively, which might lead to these lower scores. Over time, the game opens up. We're starting to see high scores, but I've certainly noticed it and um, it's pretty interesting. A couple of other comments. Overconfident Crom supporter says, we didn't lose this week, that's a plus. And Tiger Walker says, buy rounds really suck. Yes, I think when your team is not going so well, it's a bit of a relief, but with the Eagles having just had the buy, it was a relief to see football back. So I'm glad the buy rounds are over and then, um, you know, even the football come down, we'll go back to having, you know, a full round of games to talk about next week, which is something I'm looking forward to. All right, we'll start with Carlton versus Geelong. Carlton getting the job done by over 10 goals. I didn't see that coming. I, I think I've been expecting Geelong to, to come back to some extent, and I know they're bad off the bye. Um, this game was an interesting one where Carlton just sort of kept them at bay. Geelong had a bit of fight in them for three quarters, and, and particularly in the last quarter, I think Carlton, which either, they must have won that last quarter by about six goals. And what we saw here is the intersection of a pretty good stoppage team against a team that that's probably their biggest deficiency. And they scored heavily off, um, off stoppages. They scored heavily from turnover. It was a high scoring game, 138 Carlton put on the board, which again leads into this trend of Geelong conceding really high scores in games. And that's only their second highest score they've conceded for a team that's like pretty firmly in the top eight at the moment. That's that's pretty quirky. Tom DeConing, arguably the biggest plus for Carlton. You know, over the last month or however long it's been, the form that he's in has really added something different to this Carlton side that was already strong. Interesting decision to have his brother try and ruck against him. I thought that was ambitious. And uh, TDK, once again, had a really, really big impact. Oh, he's also had, you know, one of his best games. He's up to 20 goals for 2024, which, you know, when you compare it against some of the other elite smalls in the competition, Stengel's at 28. I think Stengel has the most of any small forward. And always is now within eight of that. So I thought that was interesting. We'll get through to the comments. Rich Richo the Cat says, one of the most impressive things about Carlton's win was the way they went up to another gear in the last quarter. Three-quarter time, they were 28 points up-ish, but Geelong had momentum so the game wasn't over. Within a few minutes, Carlton shut them down. They also did it to Essendon and Port, and in all three games, TDK was a big part of it. His fork recently is scary. Yeah, the way he eats, man, it's so intimidating. That was a terrible joke. I agree. I, I think the, the other thing that I saw on the round so far was Carlton's form in the first half of last quarters, and they've been able to, for a number of weeks now in a row, I think they've scored like four or five goals to almost nothing each time. And that in itself is the sign of a good team when the game's there to be won. And maybe in this game, they were like like you said, there were a few goals up, but they needed to put their foot on the gas to really make sure of the result. And they did. And that shows, I think, some development as a side. Callum Williams says, Callum's win over the Cats is the most comprehensive win I've seen the Blues have this century. It's also the first time I can back them in as potential premiers. Yeah, I think... As for the Premier's part, certainly potential. I still think there's a big gap to them in Sydney, but you know, if they, if they finish top two, we've seen crazier things happen in September. So I'm with you on that. They are a potential Premier. As for comprehensive victories, uh, being a non-Carlton supporter, I can't weigh in too heavily. I mean, I remember Gold Coast's first ever game at the Gabba, and Carlton won that pretty comprehensively, but I get your point. Um, considering the opposition, Geelong are in a bit of a form slump, we don't know, but it was a very good professional win. Lolno Tamba says Carlton is the second best team in the league right now, just behind Sydney. I would agree with that. I feel like the pack behind Sydney is still starting to organize. We probably do have Carlton, Collingwood, and Essen, and they're probably the next three. They've certainly been the most consistent, uh, Collingwood at least since round three. Under that, there's this shit mix of teams that have all been really good and really poor at various points this season, um, whereas Carlton really are building a bit of consistency. So I'd agree with that call. Diesel Power says, the cliff everyone has been predicting for 10 years has finally turned up for the Cats. And he says, players who are staging head contact to the ground need public shaming. Presume that's a Stephen May reference, but as for the Cats, yeah, again, like we've said this so many times. <laughs> we've said this so many times. I agree with their current list composition. It is looking like the end is nigh. And maybe this year they're cooked. Um, we'll see what they do from a list management point of view. I think they, they might be creative to try and prolong, you know, 
at least being in the top eight for a little bit longer. We'll see. Then we had the rematch of the 2004 grand final, the Power and the Brisbane Lions with the opposite result happening with the Power donning their grand final jumper got absolutely polax in this game. Um, you know, I, I, I did think Brisbane were a chance. I never th- would have thought that they'd win this game by, it was 80 points, 79 points. I'm just double checking that. That's crazy. I feel like the Lions kind of played them like a fiddle. Like they were dominant in clearances. The clearances were 42 to 27. Uh, you know, Port Adelaide have a supposedly strong midfield and, you know, they got battered in this game and the Lions are also a very strong, uh, strong side at scores from stoppage. In fact, they scored 55 points from this source in this game. We'll get to the comments. Um, like I said, I think the Lions really toyed with Port Adelaide. There's been a, a form run of, of, of malaise and it's looking a little bit questionable dating back to pre-buy. I think they must have had a buy recently, right? Yeah, it's either side of their buy. Players looking very disorganized on defensive transition. Again, I saw some footage on the round so far where Cancorns tears into them and players just doing weird things. It didn't look like lack of effort. It, it kind of just looked like players having mental lapses and running off players when they shouldn't have been. Very interesting. Keith Minchin says, comparing Port v. Briz to Saints v. Briz effort the previous week, I'm not sure if the Saints are as bad as me thing. It will be interesting to see how a badly stung Port Adelaide side go against the Saints at Marvel next week. That will be interesting. That will be interesting because it's very hard to back the power at the moment. But point taken on St Kilda, like I said, like against the Lions, it was almost more impressive than some of their more recent wins over Gold Coast and West Coast. Like I thought they held, held the pace okay in that game. The political loser says Brisbane are back, baby. Temporary name says Brisbane the real deal. Geelong are cooked says Brisbane are winning the flag. Porter washed and Geelong are cooked. Interesting username to post content correlation. So Brisbane currently sit 10th. Their percentage is 122 and I think they're third in the, star, in the comp for expected score, which is just one random stat, but they seem to have flipped the switch. You know, I think the Zorko move back has been good. I think their midfield is firing at the moment and they're getting a lot out of their talls, in particular like Danaher and Hipwood who struggled earlier in the season. They do seem to have gotten their shit together in a big way. Still sit 10th and it's going to require a monumental effort to stay consistent and then carry that form into finals. So, I mean, considering, like I said, there's just a shit mix of teams in there. Brisbane look like one of the best teams in that mix. Certainly on current form, can they do? Can they really go deep into finals if they miss the four, which they surely will now? I'm not too sure, but this is an experienced side, a finals hardened side. Um, so yeah, they're, they're one to watch. I think if it wasn't just such an open field at the moment, I would have my doubts, but they're playing some really damn good footy. Then we had the Sydney Derby between the Giants and the Swans, and uh, you know, I bowl, ballsily, if that is a word, tipped the Giants for an upset. And th- there is going to be a Swans upset at some point. It's just going to not be the week that I tip. Anyway, the Swans have actually now interestingly won five of the last six derbies. I didn't realize that. So there's a little bit of a dominance there, um, despite the Giants beating them in finals consistently. But what, what more is there to say about Sydney? They are a dominant team from stoppage. The midfield bats so deep. They are outstanding at scoring from the defensive half and by far the best in this stat. The way they transition the footy in this game in tricky conditions was also really impressive. And the depth of contributors is unreal. You consider that Chad Warner was, you know, kind of held out of this game, but Heaney had a good game. James Rowbottom in particular was outstanding. He had a career best 32 touches, 11 clearances, 10 score involvements. He was one of them. Goulden won the medal, his third in a row, with 41 disposals, 12 marks, 7 score involvements. Grundy also played well. You know, there's just so many considerations when you play Sydney, so many different weapons. They are very, very hard to beat at the moment. It really is going to require them dropping off a cliff for any team to beat them right now. It's crazy. As for the Giants, they've only won two of their last seven. They're in a bit of a slump, and I backed them to come out of this slump, and I am going to die on this hill. But at the moment, it's not looking great. Interestingly, in the first half of this season so far versus the second half of the season, they are averaging seven less goals per game. So offensively, there's a real issue there. Magpies two points out. Tom Green looked back to normal. I think his form dipped to carrying an ankle injury he did in the first City Derby this year. Yeah, his numbers did. His numbers kind of stayed the same. But I think he did look a little bit freer in this game. Riley Burke says it's the Swan Grand Final to lose. Yeah, it does feel like that. But like I said, we've seen this happen before where it hasn't quite panned out that way in September. And I think as well, if Collingwood get into the four, which they're currently third, I think... Maybe they're fourth, actually. I think they're in the four. They will be They will be a good challenger to Sydney. And then there's Carlton to consider as well. So I, I think there can be teams that beat them on the day, but the Swans are clearly the best team in the comp. We've got Melbourne versus North. Now, this, this exploded for comments, so I'm going to try and rattle through them. Um, it was an interesting game. I thought, you know, upset was possible. I didn't have the balls to tip it, and thankfully I didn't because North Melbourne ultimately fell short. But great last quarter. I think it was five goals to nothing. 
and they surged. And there's this switch from, you know, a little bit more of a conservative, stagnant game style North Melbourne have when they can click into gear, they play this run and gun style. I realize it's not necessarily sustainable, but when they do it, it's very, very effective. We saw Sheasel go forward, played well. Jackson Archer was outstanding this game, blanketed Bailey Fritch. Zerha, Eddie Ford played well. Um, Will Phillips did a good job on Clayton Oliver. There was so much to like about North in this game. It's just a case of, you know, putting in a four quarter effort, which is... It's kind of like the last box you tick as a young side. So I think they'll be very happy with their last three weeks. We've got a few comments. Danny Dark says, North are showing great improvement, but man, it can't be easy to be a supporter. Two absolute heartbreaks in a row. He, he says, North have been hard done by the, uh, by the umpires in the last two weeks, but the green shoots are there. Archer gave Fritch a bath. There is some more love coming for Jackson Archer. AFL Snap says, North Melbourne are building something special. And Lol November says, North is fighting hard, but are still in the rebuild stage. Could see them lift out of the bottom four, possibly as early as next year. There's no doubt that North Melbourne have unreal young talent. Um, you know, I believe Zane Durr has had a big game in the VFL. Um, you know, Colby McCurch has still got so much development left. What they're getting out of Wardlaw, Sheasel, Combin as well, some of these older guys as well. It's starting to click for them. It's just a case of sustaining that. You know, in the first two rounds of 2023, the North Melbourne we saw was very good. It was very good, and then they dropped away. This year, it's kind of been the opposite. They flipped into gear. It'll be interesting to see how long they can sustain this as a young side. There's no doubt the green shoots are there. Just keeping some of these experienced guys like Azuha as, as early as this year um, will be important, but absolutely, I, I like what I'm seeing. Jaden says, Clayton Oliver should spend a few weeks in the twos. His performances have been beeping awful recently. I swear on this channel all the time. I don't know why I censored that. Uh, Francis says, Melbourne not scoring in the final quarter against one of the worst teams in the league makes me uncertain about their finals chances. Yeah, I think there's an intersection of two things happening here. North are playing well. Um, we've got to give them that credit. Equally though, Melbourne have been horrific for a few weeks now. And there's, you know, it, it can't be just simply attributed to Petrarca missing because it started first. Max Hansen points out, to stop bad faith head contact in tackles to draw free kicks, make them spend time on the bench for a head injury assessment. Players will stop faking it real quick. So yeah, what is the current process? If a player smacks his head, like if Stephen May's grabbing his head like that, it's incumbent, if I'm not mistaken, on the club to do the their own due diligence, make sure they do a concussion assessment and they're assessed on that, right? But essentially what could happen is a player could run off the field and say, no, I'm fine, I was faking it to their own doctor. And essentially that would not really ever get picked up. You know, is there something the umpire could do? Could an umpire apply a 20 minutes head injury assessment period there. It'd be tricky. I feel like the umpires really do have a lot going on already, um, but I suppose it'd be just kind of like the blood rule. You see a player grab his head, and if he looks to be genuinely injured, if they can enforce some sort of, almost like a yellow card, but not, not a disciplinary one, just one to say, all right, go off and get assessed 20 minutes. Maybe there's something that could be done there, but agreed, it was an ugly look what happened. Pixel Knight says, Archer is impressive. Keeping Bailey Fritch goalless is not an easy task, especially for a young player. And uh, Optic Beast agrees. Yeah, Jackson Archer, Archer's had a good run of form and a nice little bonus for them, I suppose. Obviously, they've invested heavily in the top end of the draft and I think Jackson Archer was a little bit of a later one. But him coming in and playing a role for a number of weeks now, he has been impressive. And Bailey Fritch is still having a good year. You know, he's probably in the mix for all Australian forward. Um, but yeah, that was a good win for Jackson Archer. Party Pasco agrees that North are building something special. Uh, just a couple of missing pieces. Shields have moved forward. Has been more impactful than even the most optimistic North fan could have hoped. And Jackson Archer, my God. I do think Sheasel's best position long term will be forward impact midfielder and maybe at some point in his career mostly a midfielder who plays forward. I think if you've got a player who's so impactful with each possession and has forward craft that's the best way to use them and now they've got Fisher, they've got McKercher, they've got some other types like Hardeman. There's, there's opportunities for them to get run and carry through players other than Harry Sheasel. Get him in the front half. I know they've got a lot of medium forwards but he's one of their best players. Zell Mazam says forget about the Hawks making the eight. How about those kangaroos? Um, I presume that's tongue in cheek. They're definitely not making the eight but it's been gone all right. Peter Atkinson says, now that North are showing some fight, there's no easy games anymore. Anyone can win on any day. It does feel like that right at this current point in time. There will be form slumps from various teams. I feel like Melbourne <laughs> is a bit of an easy kill at the moment. I think in the last three weeks, West Coast were very much that. For a while there, Richmond was very much an easy kill. I think these cycles will continue. But I agree with your point, right at the moment, uh, like... North, at Richmond, and West Coast, who just were okay against Essendon, does show that maybe the gap's closed. And that gap's been the gap between the rest of the comp and the bottom two has been huge for a few years now. Pickle Green Guy says North Melbourne are yet to play a four quarter game. And Dean Bessel, Bessel, Bessel says Eagles lost to North doesn't look so bad anymore. Yeah, like I said, young side playing four quarters consistently and playing consistently in general is the last box you tick. So I'm not going to fixate too much on that, but you're right. Like a lot of their 
games, their wins the last three weeks have been two or three good quarters and they've just got the one win from it. But either way, they're playing well. As for the Eagles' loss, I mean, I think North probably played better against Collingwood and, and possibly even better against Melbourne than they did against us. They were good. They, they were dominant. Maybe that's not fair. I just think West Coast were pretty poor. Like, they were really bad in that game. So it was a little bit of both. I don't think we played our best and got beaten. I think we were poor as well. Essendon defeated West Coast by five goals. I did this uh, stream on the channel as well, and I have a review coming out. It'll probably be up by now um, on the True Eagle YouTube channel for Eagles fans. Uh, we got a couple of comments from this game. HBR says, Essendon will miss finals. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this comment came before the game started. I don't agree. You know, I, I did do my ladder prediction. I had Essendon ninth, and... I feel silly about that now. Having just watched that game, I thought it was a very professional performance against a West Coast side that played pretty well, at least, you know, played their brand and won clearances, won inside 50s in Essendon, just had a response every time. Very clinical with the way they would pick to part West Coast on transition. It was very much two teams playing competing styles. West Coast winning the or breaking even contested, winning the clearance. But then as soon as the ball would get on the outside, Essendon would just pick apart West Coast with ease. And in the end, there were five goals better. And I am impressed by that from Essendon. I think it showed a maturity we haven't seen from them in a little while. It's hard to back against them. It's hard to back against them. Are they necessarily a top contender? I'm not sure. But I don't think they are as fragile as they've looked in the, in the past. I think that was a pretty professional win, as I said. Dean says, Eagles are looking much quicker this week based on personnel. Brockman's chase down in the, th- in the second half was unbelievable. They did look quicker. I-, I think they looked less fatigued was the way I saw it. I think they were like running on top of the ground a little bit better. Um, as for leg speed, though, I think on, on transition, Essendon were far too quick. Is that a team defense? Is it like structural thing? Is it a leg speed thing? It might be a bit of both. But I do agree with your assessment generally. We'll move on to the final game, Fremantle versus the Gold Coast Suns. This didn't get any comments. I don't know if that's down to like the time that I posted asking for comments on this weekend. Uh, I'm not too sure. But either way, We'll just summarize that Fremantle were 20 points too good for the Gold Coast Suns. I think it got up to about a six-goal lead. The Suns came back. I think Flanders moved into the midfield, and that worked well. Um, Nonetheless, I think the Dockers midfield, it's pretty much the best in the game at the moment. Won the clearances 44 to 32, and uh, between Brayshaw, Young, and Sorong, I think they kicked five goals. Hayden Young having a great year, kicking three goals in that role as well. It's Sean Darcy having 13 or 12 clearances. Good professional win from Fremantle as well. They up to fifth. Um, You know, I think... Fremantle form part of this group of teams that have looked either really good or really poor at various points this year. What works for Fremantle is that they have a very young core. So longer term, I don't think this is a massive concern that their their worst form has been bad. But you can't say they don't deserve to be fifth because like all the teams below them have looked poor. Like Geelong and Port Adelaide, I think both sit in the top eight. Melbourne's not that far behind. Fremantle do have a really good opportunity to make finals from this point on and uh, they'll be happy with that win. To finish off the show, we got four general comments on the round. So Amusement Production says, just a general one, everyone needs to settle down on the season over claims after a top 13 team loses. Any team below second are frauds, but that's still a lot of open final spots. So just enjoy this roller coaster of the season. I'm not sure about the frauds part. I think, um, you know, Collingwood are not in the top two and I don't think they're frauds, for instance. That's just off the top of my head. However, I do agree with your point. Like I said, with so many teams playing well and then playing terribly, and so many question marks over so many teams currently in top eight spots that I agree you can't say season over. And again, we should have learned that last year when Carlton and GWS made the runs that they did to get very close to playing each other in a grand final. Sean Taylor says, when a player goes to ground to pick up the ball, they are required to release the ball. If they don't and are tackled, it's holding the ball. If they do release the ball, but then the tackler drags the ball into the play being tackled and holds it in, why isn't the tackler then pinned with holding the ball? I do like this logic, you know, you see the amount of players who have the ball dragged under them. If the intention is to stop players forcing stoppages and stoppages slow down the game, then you'd think that the player who initiates it, even if he is the tackler, should be penalized for it. I don't know what the reason is. You never really see that paid against the player who doesn't have the ball, and it might just be simply legislated in the rules that you can't be caught holding the ball if you don't have possession. Is it a change they could make? Yeah, I would like to see that because you see that's such a source of discontent with umpiring decisions is the dragging it in, at least in my opinion. Play on footy says, Laura Kane can't talk herself out of clear, dubious umpiring decisions. She had Cameron's goal and the siren being one of them, clearly deviated. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think across the board, it's interesting to see the inconsistency of which umpiring decisions the AFL will concede they got wrong, which they didn't. Sydney Carlton Grand Final, I, I yeah, it's looking... Possible. Sydney Collingwood. Um, I said Sydney GWS a few weeks ago, and I don't want to look like a nuffy by going back on that. 
but it is looking bad. And finally, Sean Christie says, North and West Coast are better than the latter position suggests. Geelong and Port are worse than the latter suggests. A rough season for tipping. Very much agree with that. Currently, North and West Coast are better than the latter position suggests. I think across the board, that those rankings are reflective of how the season's gone. But I agree with you right now, especially with some of these teams, particularly in the middle part of the ladder, being inconsistent. With, with Brisbane and Hawthorne being some of the form sides of the comp, and not long ago, not being considered a real chance for finals. It looked like season over for both of them. Now, those are two of the top five, six teams that you don't want to play right now. And equally, you know, teams are vulnerable against the North Melbourne right now. Um, and West Coast has been up and down, but playing them at Optus Stadium is no longer the easy fixture it was over the last 24 months. Like, th- there is a good version of West Coast. So, it's good. Like, like I said, hopefully the gap is tightening between... Some of these teams in the competition at the moment at Sydney on their own level. Um, but other than that, there's a big shit mix in the middle. That's all we've got time for today, guys. Thank you for your contributions. Like I say, keep an eye out each weekend. I probably do it like Saturday night, Sunday morning. I'll do a post on the YouTube community tab. If you want to contribute, it'd be great. For now, I'll say goodbye and I thank you for watching. See you later.